Athens, please, ladies and gentlemen, in a few minutes we arrive at the port of Mytilene. Passengers destination to Mytilene are kindly requested to disembark immediately after the vessel safe burning. I crossed from Iraq to Turkey legally, by passport. I moved from Iraq, went to Istanbul looking for a smuggler to help me come to Greece, to come to Europe. And they tell you stay here, we call you. And then the moment they ca it comes, they call you and mix you with a lot of other people from other places, from Africa, from Middle East, all across the Middle East, you know. Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iran, Syria, everybody. You don't know anybody. And you are uh, staying with them like, if you are lucky, you know, one hour on the boat. If you are not lucky, like me, 10 hours on a boat. In Izmir, and there is a jungle, okay, near the sea. It's a, you know, shore, shore of the jungle when they are preparing the boats. And they delayed our journey one night. So we spent one night in jungle for another group of people to come and join us the next night. And after that, they sent us to the um, sea. When you get into this situation, all of the sudden, you don't have the time to do the research. So you just put your faith and your destiny in the hands of some people which you don't know. It's a very dangerous game. I just sat in the middle of the boat. It was, you know, water was inside the boat. And I just sat like this because, you know, like uh, when you are disappointed from everything, from life, from future, from faith, uh, you see nothing it's all your life is darkness. You just um, wish that uh, that moment ends. I told you yesterday, our boat was sent not to Arab because we are sent from a route which was, uh, I'm thinking, still thinking of it. Why our journey took so long, over 10 hours. So uh, smugglers, criminals, governments, criminals, everybody is hitting refugees. That's the feeling uh, before they uh, put you on the boat. They previously they have arranged with one of the, um, the people who wants to come here. They arranged to train this guy. In return, uh, this guy so drive the boat. So they this guy won't pay the smugglers. Instead, he just drives the boat and he is not paying the smuggler. It's like for free, but it's risking the rest of other lives. They train the guy for five minutes before they put all of the other people on the boat. And then you see an uh, amateur guy who is driving the boat. First, the guy was doing well. The, the guy who was, uh, you know, guiding the boat. First, he was doing well, then after one hour, everything become, you know, we were just doing this, zig, doing zigzag over, over water. So I told myself, we are fucked. This is Samus, the whole island. But there, there are a lot of small towns here, small villages. And we are landed in Karlovas. At that time, I told you we were 35 or a bit more, okay? All of those people got detained. Because police came immediately after our landing, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, okay? We had to uh, swim like 200 meters before we reached the shores. So all of our clothes were entirely wet. So I went to a mountain, a mountain, big mountain, to help my clothes, to change them and to let other clothes get dry. So I spent two hours on the top of mountain and police wouldn't come to the mountain to look for me or anyone else. I had somebody here in Athens and he, he arranged buy a ticket for me to get into a ferry and come to Athens. Unbelievable, this is unbelievable situation.
unbelievable situation in 21st century this is happening you know what is this civilization this is not civilization this is not civilization this is not protection this is not humanity this is nothing what is our crime Yeah, it was, I mean, we had nothing ourselves with the economic situation and things, we're struggling, so we would just find anything we could. Um, we gave away our towels, our blankets, our clothes, um, especially trying to get the kids warm and dry. This winter time here is really cold, a lot of snow, a lot of cold weather, and, and these kids were soaking wet. Could only be compared to a war zone. I mean, you see the pictures of the beaches and things, and we were talking um, with a, f a friend actually from Team Humanity, Salam Al Din, because he was here with us late 2015, and we were talking to him about the arrivals. and And one photo we've got with one of the beaches down on the track, with, with like you could see there was about 15 boats just come in. The, beach is full of people there's another sort of five six boats coming in in the shot and then in the distance on the bay behind you could see exactly the same thing happening and that was a snapshot of sort of September and then it just got worse then the big boats came and the wooden boats were the most horrific thing yeah that's my trauma was the big boats they they started in September using um, open boats that were like wooden boats from cruise ships and things like the the lifeboat size and on those they would have maybe 150 200 people and then they started using anything anything so they were just sinking we lost so many people in october from the big boats um, and they're charging people 2004 2008 for the safe trip in this big wooden boat and most of the boats weren't seaworthy they were so old they just like covered the holes and the cracks and things and they probably would have made the crossing fine if they had one or two fishermen on there but not 300 people <laughs> and by i guess may it had increased to five ten boats a day and by october 200 boats a day biggest day in october was 12,000 people between here and scala scaminia 12,000 people in one day it just the the whole sea from here was just boat after boat after boat you just count 40 50 boats coming so yeah but even now when it's much quieter obviously than 215 um april 24th we still lost a boat of people so we found there was 16 bodies recovered two survivors and seven missing yeah, it's tough. Last night we had a boat of 22, came in around 11 p.m. last night, and then the night before was a boat of 58. They're still kind of nightly arriving. The thing is they're still there ready to cross, and where they increase the police presence, the refugee, well, the smugglers, because the refugees don't know where they are, the smugglers just move from one location to another location. So now they've increased the, the sort of patrols in Chios. So it's it stepped up here in the last week, the, the arrivals are higher. I think we're up to uh, about a thousand, maybe more, just on Lesvos for this month.
we can't predict the future based on the past, but we can make a kind of a good guess. So we have had this week already more than 100 arrivals in the north of Lesbos. Um, I would say about four boats a week at the moment, so every other day in the north of Lesbos. Um, I think by the 11th day of June we had surpassed the number of arrivals for the entire of May. So we are seeing an increase, but it must be said that last year, you know, as the summer months came in, they also saw an increase as well. So, then again, it is difficult to make too kind of many comments about trends but definitely as it got colder the number of boats dropped off but what must also be said that the NGO response becomes a lot more important during the colder months even though you have less boats the condition that the people come in when they arrive is much much worse um, you have to understand that here in the winter we have snow and things and it's, it's a really really it's not a clement winter at all so we were still having arrivals coming in and then they were in a you know a lot of hypothermia like a lot of wet people so it was a very different conditions and um, but yeah for sure in the winter months we saw a drop and then now we're seeing a pick up again so our belief that obviously these people have a very long journey and a very difficult journey but this stretch of water like you know 5.5 nautical miles approximately is one particularly dangerous element of that journey people usually come over in dinghies which are kind of overloaded uh, rubber boats with lots and lots of people on them self-driven very dangerous boats or smuggler boats when they arrive we aim to meet the boat and provide the people with basic humanitarian assistance so that's the the direct response and our objective is to send them on the next step of their journey in the best condition possible when we see a boat we don't ourselves actually have rescue boats there's other NGOs that have the rescue boats so we're like the Coast Guard and the rescue boats and it's them who the objective is to go and intercept the boat um, and then they will bring it into shore and then we will meet the boat with a car so we actually have a car that drives to meet the boat if the boat is not intercepted so if we get an alert that maybe a boat's coming in and there's no boat that's going to intercept it in time in that case we drive to that landing point location and try and get to the people we work with a medical NGO and stuff and go down and check the people are okay and then do the logistical nightmare of getting the people out of that situation and into one of the camps here. And I suppose the next stage you need to be aware of is opening the transit camp. So that's when the people arrive, we get permission from the authorities to take the people to a camp where we can better look after them and they're safer. So we operate in the camps, we have our own camp here, Lighthouse Camp, it's the only shoreside camp um, in the north of Lesbos. Stage two is a UNHCR camp and it's operated uh, in partnership with Euro Relief and Samaritan's Purse and Lighthouse is one of the major contributors to supporting it. Um, and then finally the cheese factory was not the final camp and it was created by Borderline Europe. So you can see there's Oh, and the medical team, sorry, the most important team, Waha. So Waha were the previous partners to UN, the medical partners to UNHCR. That partnership has now finished, but we still have a Waha doctor. During 2015, when you had a lot of boats crossing, a lot of boats were coming and landing at the lighthouse of Caracas. Now that was partially because of the volume of boats crossing, but also because of the light on this very, very dark coast that was attracting boats. That was problematic for two reasons. One, because the lighthouse is obviously there to warn boats off the very dangerous rocks. So you have boats essentially coming into the most dangerous part. And then two, if they manage to land safely, I would say it's approximately a two hour walk to the nearest um, kind of village. So people in a very deteriorated condition were then having to walk up um, for like two hours and so that when a boat managed to land they were unable to offer any assistance and when a boat lands at Caracas you need to give assistance very very quickly and it takes the cars about probably 45 minutes to arrive there with the landing teams. At that stage it was illegal to drive any refugees in your car so when we started to help people like just getting them off the dirt road because there's like nine kilometers of, of rough terrain between here and Scala Scaminia. So we'd just be helping them get off that road at least so they'd get into shade or into a safer place. Um, but technically we couldn't put them in our car. There was at that stage no doctor here, literally. There was not, no doctor for the village. So um, we had people coming in with previous conditions from shrapnel, from bullet wounds, um, infected wounds, and then injuries that they'd sustained where they'd been beaten by the smugglers on the other side 
or they'd fallen here. We had one guy um, early May came out of a boat here and he'd um, had a laceration to his leg that was so deep the, the blood was pumping out of. And there's no doctor, there's no ambulance, there was nothing. Just us, a first aid kit and whatever we could do. So, But when there was so many people and it was still illegal, it was ridiculous. I mean, you're talking July, August time, it was so hot. And these people had to walk three days to Mytilene with their kids and their bags and it was it was awful. And, and it's so hard to, to drive past vulnerable people in that condition. And I think a lot did stop and pick them up, even though it was illegal. And sometimes under cover of darkness, they would drive people. But um, yeah, they, they lifted the laws later in the year. But before that, there was a couple of solidarity drives where um, in conjunction with the unions and the um, Greek solidarity groups, they actually broke the embargo against driving people, but they did it in a convoy. So there was like 40, 50 cars just actually drove the island picking up refugees with a police es escort just to prove a point. And then an exemption was made um, by the government um, later in the year that said, yes, you can actually drive refugees as long as you have police permission. You know, they, they were walking to Mytilene. It was horrific. No human being could watch these kids being dragged across the island and, and not be upset by it. So you had people with houses taking them in for the night or they'd take them in in the afternoon and keep them to the night and then secretly drive them to Mytilene so no one would see them walking. You had tourists picking them up pretending that, you know, and hoping they wouldn't get arrested. Now we have a 24 hour watch in conjunction with the other groups. So we all work together. We have a WhatsApp group where everyone communicates what they see, what's going on. The idea is that we avoid loss of life. That's the biggest thing, but also to observe the issues going on with the border control. Because by law, if the boat crosses the halfway point, they are entitled to apply for asylum. So they have to be rescued and brought to Greece. If nobody's watching, all sorts of different things happen. Boats get taken back. Um, Turkish Coast Guard come into Greek waters, tow backs from uh, other groups. So, so with with us there, we're kind of watching them, but they know we're there. We don't. We we keep within the law always, and they we work with the police as much as we can because the way we see it, the police have their job to do. We have ours. Uh, we're here to save lives and for no pol political agenda at all, just to stop people dying in this ocean. Again, you know, we all have our job to do and we've tried to communicate as best as we can with Frontex. We've spoken with uh, um, the heads of Frontex from Poland. They've been here to visit us. Um, we have had issues with certain groups. Certain groups come and they're quite abusive. Um, we had a lot of problems with the groups from Malta, very abusive to our volunteers, to the doctors, to us generally. Yeah, well, how Frontex works is, is that they have very few employees, mostly it's sort of the, the, the Coast Guard from certain countries, so they kind of lend their forces for a fee to Frontex. So at the moment, um, it was funny the night before last we have Polish, uh, not Polish, uh, Portuguese at the moment and it's Portuguese land and sea forces. So, and they still have their job to do. They're still there to patrol borders. They're still European police, but they're actually just so nice. <laughs> just lovely. They were so lovely and the atmosphere is different then. I mean, the job gets done exactly the same. But you get no stress with the refugees, no stress with the NGOs. Everybody's working nicely together. They even questioned them the same as anyone else would, but it was questions done very quietly and gently, and they get more cooperation that way. And we invite them to our... We have a meeting every two weeks that's hosted by the UNHCR, and we invite Frontex to join us. We also invite the Coast Guard. Frontex do come if they can. The Coast Guard have never come. But Frontex will come, and, and I... If I have any issues or concerns, they've asked me to email them directly in Poland to explain what the incidents that have gone on and they will address them. So they've been really open with us. If you think of it like 
The Coast Guard are responsible for boats arriving here. They're the main authority. And then the official boats underneath them, you have NATO and Frontex, who are operating underneath them. And their objective is obviously border control. But then once the boats cross into Greek waters, it's similar to our objectives. It's making sure the people are safe and coming in safe off the sea. Um, so Frontex has a land team and boat teams and a helicopter team. So in this instance, Frontex contributed by sending a land team to confirm to the Coast Guard that the people could not be taken out by road because that's always their preference because it is safer to get the people off the water. Um, they then sent a boat to help with the rescue boat to take the people onto the boat and head to Scala. So the authorities, I'm in the Coast Guard, it's also called the Port Police but they're the same thing so they're responsible for boats arriving so they're the ones who make the decision on which, where the people are transported to, how they're transported, that kind of thing. So it's all the Hellenic Coast Guard. You know, when we started this, we always thought that we would be doing it for such a short time because help will come. This is Europe. It's not going to be left to random people who live here to sort this out, to help people, to save people. And what are we now? Two and a half years later, we're still waiting for help to come because all this work here is still done by independent groups, by small NGOs. Okay, the UNHCR is here now, but they don't really do much. We've got, we're lucky in the north now, we've got a, a local man that they've given a job with the UNHCR and he's really good at coordinating with all the groups of getting everything organised so, and dealing with the Coast Guard directly because he's local so it works. Yeah, we also have all the small NGOs. So this is groups that were set up specifically to deal with this scenario or, or groups that have come in from elsewhere. So. Um, in 2015, the first group we had uh, was a few volunteers from the Netherlands, which was the Boat Refugee Foundation. Then came um, some people from Norway who then set up Drop in the Ocean. So that was set up here, they were working with us. Um, then that was pretty much the first professionals that we'd had. Um, they were bringing in paramedics, firefighters, rescue workers, so actually people that were trained to deal with crisis. So they were coming as, as volunteers. Um, at the same time, our first medical group arrived, which was WAHA, which is Women and Health Association based in France. And then later on, uh, the first rescue, sea rescue team we had was Proactiva from Barcelona, and they are still here still awesome, still doing the same job. I mean, when they first came, they had no equipment, nothing. They just came to assess um, and ended up working crazy hours just trying to save people. Then slowly, slowly, they built up their equipment. They, they've had a permanent team here ever since, so, and they're still here now. Um, Lighthouse Relief in uh, Scala Scaminia started, l I guess, later on 215 again it was a grassroots group a um, few swedish people later they became an ngo and they're still here and then there's the big groups so many big groups that still i don't i don't know what they do you know the situation at the moment is all the money is coming from europe to the greek government that's then being given to the big ngos so the greek government are taking their cut before they dish it out to the NGOs and then the NGOs are taking their cut so by the time it gets to the refugees it's a ridiculous amount of money there's nothing being spent on refugees and yet the money coming from the EU is directly to the Greek government is approximately 14,000 euros per refugee for the year to be fair if you gave that directly to the refugee they'd be fine so all of that money has been eaten up with administration charges and yet you're still keeping people in camps if they've given the refugees that in housing, let them go rent a property, pay their own bills, have some kind of standard of living, it would be much better. The UNHCR, the Red Cross, Save the Children, Oxfam, um, what do they do? It's, yeah, they're all here. They all get paid a great deal of money from the EU via the Greek government. The UNHCR's job is protection. So they've literally, I think, the maximum staff here was 60, which has now been cut back down. So they basically just oversee the work of everybody else. They don't really do anything. 
Yeah, I mean, some some of these big NGOs have registered in Greece now. Lighthouse Relief, I think, is a Greek charity, um, and a few others. Um, there's some small ones, uh, a lot of solidarity groups, and there's some really good small Greek NGOs. In um, again, in in Kalani, we had when everyone was walking, there was a priest had set up. Um, uh, a shelter basically for refugees so they could rest, um, get better shoes, have something to eat, a little medical care. Um, again, Angalia was running from 2012, so this is this is a Greek NGO that was doing this before anyone else arrived. And there's bigger Greek NGOs which I only hear feedback from the refugees and the care that they get, and it's it's not nice. The the, the bigger groups are not, um, yeah. Uh, so the Greek NGOs felt that, uh, that the, these transnational NGOs are receiving way too much fund for what they are doing. And this was really the case, they were not doing anything. Uh, you, you have to also understand that the international NGOs were not high, you know, they, they were, the high paying jobs were all coming from abroad. Uh, so uh, only the low level jobs were given to locals. So they, they, in terms of employment and economical issues were, there too. The general population in Lesbos has a distrust towards NGOs because they saw them at work when they arrived. First of all, they arrived very late. Uh, they, uh, they started arriving in early 2017, which, uh, sorry, early 2016, which was almost a year later. Uh, and it was all volunteers and locals that were doing the rescue, uh, running the rescue operations, shelter, food, etc. And many locals reported to me personally that the, one of the reasons, well, they wouldn't call it the reason for their distrust, but they would explain how the NGOs would uh, fight over refugees to take photos with them for funding. So they, they understood that for them it was just a money-making machine and nothing but that uh, and and so the, the locals were not were disillusioned about the humanitarianism of the NGOs really I, and they, they because they saw it firsthand. Lighthouse Relief was founded here in Scala, the village of Scala in Lesbos in September 2015 so that was at a time when you had a large influx of boats coming over which became known as the refugee crisis. Um, the response was pretty much just the local population assisting. Then you had individual volunteers coming out independently offering very sporadic assistance. And then the larger NGOs. So three of those in, uh, sorry, independent volunteers came together and they created Lighthouse Relief here in Scala. Obviously since that time we all know the situation has changed a lot. We have more issues now with stagnant populations in Europe and stuff and so what you've seen is Lighthouse itself kind of changed. So we're still based here in Scala doing what we call emergency response, so responding to the boats arriving but we're also based in the mainland offering services in the camps in the mainland uh, just to also help with, with the other issues that have arisen from what is known as the refugee crisis for a better were to describe it. So to operate our emergency response um, in like a, a quite a nice restful way I need nine volunteers and then in addition to that Lighthouse operates other projects including Eco which is the cleaning of the beaches and upcycling which is kind of using the material and the rubbish that has been left by all these arrivals and using it in a more positive way. So currently I think I have about 30 volunteers, 16 of them dedicated to emergency response and then the rest of them doing kind of eco and upcycling and working in the camp and stuff. It's interesting actually, you could be uh, have a landing team going to a landing and you could have a, you know, a retired fireman, a nurse, you know, maybe a management consultant and a student. Like, you know, you have a really, really huge range of skills, backgrounds, ages, um, that kind of thing. We always have a preemptive element of our work and that's what we call spotting. So spotting is having teams 
up on the hillsides. Uh, we collaborate with other NGOs to do that and we watch the water for boats crossing. One, for if they're getting into any dangers, then we can alert the Coast Guard, we can let NGO rescue boats and then they can go and assist. And two is to intercept the boats. So once the dinghy crosses the border into Greek waters, they have to be brought into Greek shores. They have to have a chance to have their asylum claim heard. Okay? It's much safer if that boat is intercepted and brought into a port rather than landing itself on these rocky cliffs. As you can see around us, this isn't a nice sandy shoreline, it's a very rocky, dangerous shoreline. So when we see a boat, we share that information with lots of different actors. The objective is to intercept the boat and bring it in safely. So the two key elements, I suppose, of emergency response are the responding and then the preemptive thing to try and ensure that that landing itself is actually a bit safer. Uh, primarily we spot at night time um, because that's when most boats cross because that's when they can usually avoid the authorities in the Turkish waters. We use night vision equipment to look at the water and actually we cannot see dinghies which through the night vision equipment, I can show you a photo if you want, it's like a tiny tiny dot so we actually cannot see them when they're in Turkish waters. We can really only see them when they arrive in Greek waters so we don't really have that problem with looking at boats crossing and stuff. We're only really able to see kind of two, three, maybe three nautical miles in the best conditions possible, but we're only actually able to see a short area. Um, we split the coast with other NGOs, so we spot at night from one area, another from another area, and then we have the whole Greek kind of northern shoreline covered. Spotting teams, Lighthouse, Relief does spotting. Um, Refugee Rescue is another organisation, an, an Irish organisation that does spotting. And then there's some independent volunteers, which we call the FDLU team, but they're associated with two independent volunteers called the Kempsons, who are fairly well known for being quite active here. So that's spotters. Then rescue boats, Proactiva Open Arms. So Proactiva was a Spanish lifeguard organisation, um, and when the crisis was kind of picking up in 2015, they created Proactiva Open Arms, sent rescue boats here and now they operate in the Med as well. So they're based here and in addition to that refugee rescue also has a rescue boat which is the one behind us which is called Makara. Obviously it's important to have all of the north covered. I mean that would be the dream to intercept every boat but realistically we don't have those resources and the boats come into such different areas that you can never make that prediction. So. You can see we have quite a lot of NGOs here, but everyone's got a distinct purpose. So I don't think any of us could operate without the other ones because it's quite a nice model actually where we all rely on each other, but it's not like com competitive for, for you know, access to people or provision of service and stuff because we work in kind of a nice little flow system. So it's good. But you know, still you see every week people are drowning. Many people are drowning every, every week. Every week. Why? Why? Our lives doesn't matter. Refuse is our life is life, like everyone else's life. Refuse is lives matter. We are human beings. There's always been refugees here. It's not a, a new thing. This is where people are confused. This has always been an island of refugees, historically and in recent years. So every time there is an increase in conflicts or anything else going on, we get more refugees. But in 2014, late 2014, we realised how much the situation had changed. Um, it was on a trip to Turkey. First time we'd left the country for, I don't know, 15 years. We thought we'd go to Turkey for a day with my daughter. Um, and we got to the port in Mytilene and realised that outside in the port was full of women, kids, men, um, just sitting outside. They had no shelter, nothing. And then we realised how bad it had got. And then we started to see here a lot more families arriving. So we'd be leaving to take my daughter to school and there'd be sort of kids on the road with their families. Just... <laughs> At one point in Mytilene, there was 29,000 people sleeping in the harbour. 29,000. It was unbelievable. And the stench, because there's no toilets. And instead of the, the people of Mytilene reacting with anger, they came out, they put up a banner that said, we all eat together. It was really special. And I can't imagine another group of people acting like that. 
it was it was incredible. Lesbos is another touristic island really, uh, not so much like Rhodes or other islands. Uh, so you will not see these massive resorts. So the refugees have become part of the daily life. Some people, of course, they are annoyed by it. Some people are just tired. Some people still uh, provide solidarity, support. Uh, there are places that refugees, such as Cafe P, uh, Boviras, and other places where refugees just uh, can go sit at a table. They are not required to order anything. They, they can use the Wi-Fi for free. And uh, the, the, the employees always bring a glass of water as well. Uh, so the everyday life is uh, simultaneously a limbo and an exciting movement where everything will possibly change within a few hours. Uh, you have a new deportation, you have a person being arrested. As, as much of a crisis as it is, uh, going back to the, to the ancient meaning of our word cri crisis, crisis, the Greek crisis also meant a choice, so it had the connotation of opportunity as well. So this crisis, I believe, offered uh, both the refugees as well as the young Europeans, uh, young and old, an opportunity, an opportunity to think beyond the state. It's the question of whether this is a crisis, because I think a crisis suggests something that is happens at a particular moment, that is a kind of explosion, and then dissipates. I think there's been a big build up to this so-called crisis and actually anyone who was looking and thinking about it could see that this was going to happen that actually the situation in Jordan the situation in Lebanon and the situation in Turkey was such that it was impossible for people to stay the problem with crisis is it kind of forgets that actually there are multiple other so-called crises that are happening the bombing the wars in which Europe and the United States and North America is deeply, deeply implicated. So to present what's happening at the borders of Europe as something that is either kind of a temporary blip um, or is something that Europe and Europeans have to respond to in a way that is humanitarian rather than actually this is the least we can do, the least we can do, given not just the bombing of Syria, not just the wars in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, but also the histories of colonialism, the current relationships that are making it possible to extract massive resources from the global south from, you know niger one of the poorest countries in fact if not the poorest country in the world whose uranium lights one in three of the light bulbs in france but the nigerian people themselves can't come so the uranium can come the resources can come but not the people so i suppose I just think that it's not about humanitarianism, which is also the problem of the terminology refugee, I would say, and crisis, but it's actually, this is a duty that we have, this is a responsibility. I mean, I know that there's been a lot of debate over whether to call it a refugee crisis or a migrant crisis. And in a way, I think that's a legitimate debate because I think that one thing that we've seen is happening politically is the reinscription of the refugee migrant dichotomy and distinction, which actually I think kind of in recent years had started to become much more acknowledged as being much more problematic, not just in academia, but also in, uh, in activism and even in some kind of policy circles. So I think, which I think is a positive thing because obviously the political and the economic are connected and I think there's something about seeing refugees and migrants as if they're completely different species of being and also have different legitimacies for moving is 
politically not helpful. Although I can see why people want to retain the refugee distinction because it's actually easier to get rights, one of the few spaces where you can get rights, where you can not become illegalised by crossing a border. I think Europe is in a bind with the refugee crisis actually because on the one hand it prides itself on human rights, on liberalism, on ideals like um, freedom, democracy and on the other hand it has these incredibly harsh borders and I think that in the past the idea of the refugee was actually played quite an important function because the idea of the refugee was look we can we are also open to human rights of people who are not citizens so it shows that we will offer rights to those who are not citizens because we recognize their humanity and that's very important in I would say Europe's idea of itself well you can do that when it's a few thousand, particularly when they're from communist countries. But when actually you're talking about millions of people and they're not from communist countries, uh, the politics become much more difficult and the question of the borders and the integrity of the borders comes to the fore. I mean, I am, to put it really crudely, I think that we just wish people would just stay over there and die just where we don't have to see you. So, and I think you can see that really vividly illustrated in, you know, in these questions of Mediterranean, the bodies washing up on the shore, the kind of tourists, you know, the tourists sitting under their umbrella while people kind of are drowning. And there was a, there was an article in one of the UK tabloids, which is very infamous for its negativity to asylum seekers and migrants but which is I think the highest got the highest circulation of all newspapers uh, the Daily Mail and they did a story from Kos in Greece and it was an interview with some tourists who were complaining about how they'd gone to Greece every year and had really nice holiday but now it's being spoiled by the migrants and uh, one of them said well you know you can't eat in a restaurant you can't enjoy your meal when you see so many people outside looking in and so we're not going to be coming here anymore and I thought that was really actually a very telling phrase that you can't eat in a restaurant because you've got all these poor people outside and the fact is, the problem is, at that moment in that space, you can see them. You're confronted with them. If only they would be a few hundred miles away where you didn't have to see them, then you could stay in the restaurant and you could eat your meal. And you can eat your meal in Oxford and you can eat your meal in London and you don't have to be confronted with that grotesque inequality, with that level of poverty and with the results of the kind of distribution of the world that we live in. So I think the, that's the problem for Europe. Increasingly, that's the problem, that this, the reality of that world outside its borders is getting more and more in the face of ordinary people. So we can know it in theory, but actually have to experience it in your daily life, I think is quite different. And then the only response is to completely otherize those people, to make them so different from you that you don't have to think of them as being like you in any way, that you owe them anything. And I think, you know, that's a real danger. That's a real danger.
the EU Turkey deal is, is part of a larger European policy of, of trying to prevent further immigration to Europe. And so trying to move the problem somewhere else. Um, and of course, we, we think that deportation of refugees to Turkey is, is illegal because their rights will be violated there. And even deportation of, of people who've had their cases rejected um, because of the conditions they'll face when they arrive in Turkey, we think is, is in violation of international law. People who are arriving to the Greek islands from Turkey, uh, they have to first show that Turkey is not a safe country for them um, to have applied for protection in Turkey. So this means that people are going through an admissibility procedure in Lesbos and other islands where they need to first show the Greek government that um, they didn't have an opportunity and they would not be able to get protection in Turkey. So Turkey actually only grants refugee status to European citizens. Uh, to any non-Europeans, you can apply for international protection, you can apply for refugee status, uh, but if your case is accepted, it's the UNHCR who actually processes it, and then you can be in a, kind of a waiting list to be relocated to third countries, but you don't actually get refugee protection in Turkey. And this process is a very long process, and meanwhile you are denied your right to mobility, to education, to work, because of all the other restrictions that are in place in Turkey. The situation of people who are arriving to Greece and then sent back to Turkey uh, is even worse because anyone who is sent back from Greece to Turkey is, or are going to be detained in centers where there's limited access to lawyers, to medical care, to education. And so um, a lot of what we do is prepare people to, to show why in their specific case um, all of these circumstances in Turkey will, will make Turkey a, an unsafe place for them. I mean, in a way, what the EU-Turkey deal shows is the hollowness of humanitarianism and the hollowness of the EU's position on the refugee crisis, quite clearly. There's a concern about numbers, the concern that actually Greece is not able to hold all these people in. Like, Greece is okay as a buffer state, but then, given the permeability of the borders of that buffer state, I think the EU decided it just wasn't prepared to tolerate that. Everyone who arrives on the island is registered in Moria. So this is where the Greek Asylum Office has its offices, where the first reception center is located, where everyone's applications on the island are processed. So this is really the central place where uh, all refugees are processed and where most refugees are, are living. Um, and so there are two other camps on the, that are operating on the island. Um, one, Karatepe, is also run by um, the Greek government, and this is where um, vulnerable individuals and mostly families are being, um, being transferred out of Moria. Um, PICFA is a self-organized camp uh, started by Greek solidarity groups, and, and so it's outside of the government-run um, camps, but they also coordinate with UNHCR and with the other camps to prioritize transfer of, of individuals who are not safe in Moria or, or Karatepe for various reasons. I mean, the main problem is there was really a lack of preparation for winter when everyone knew winter was coming. And so people were living in summer tents in Moria for months. There was some winterization that was done in some of the camps, but not enough. Um, and several individuals ended up dying in, in Moria. Now the situation is much different. I mean, they, before the um, EU-Turkey agreement, they pretty much emptied the island. There wasn't many people left refugee-wise from there. They expanded the camp, the detention area of the camp of Moria. So it's now a razor-wired detention center. The camp of Karatepe is uh, now upgraded. So everyone should have uh, isoboxes, not tents. But then they're fighting about the electricity this week of who gets to pay for it. So Karatepe camp, is, it's still a camp, but in, by sort of the standards around the world, it's one of the best camps. 
it's very well run. The guy uh, Stavros that runs it from the municipality is a very caring guy. He doesn't like to see it as a camp. It's a community. Moria is a different situation. I mean, it's the the conditions there are a little better now, but um, this winter was horrific. Uh, most of the population were living in outside in small summer tents because when it was built, there was only capacity for 750. Then they expanded it to 1,005. By that stage, they had probably close more than 4,000, 4,500 people in the camp. So mostly they were living in, in terrible conditions in little summer tents with tarps over the top to try and protect them from the wind and the cold. No electricity, no central heating, nothing. After the deaths and the cold in Moria and, and also that week, the uh, Minister for Immigration announced that nobody was in tents in Greece. So we had the 3,000 people that we had in tents were just, yeah, they didn't count. So I think it was a rush after the deaths to try and, almost like a cover-up, to try and improve the situation really fast. PICPA, as I said, has been running since 2012. So this was originally, um, in Greece you had these children's camps called PICPA. So there were summer camps for um, working families for their kids to go on holiday. So there'd be children's camps. So the kids would go to another island or they'd come from Athens to the, to the islands to have like a week's holiday paid for by the state. That hasn't functioned for a lot of years and the Solidarity Group took it over in 2012 so they've been helping refugees from then on. Medical cases, um, cases with uh, bereaved family members where they've lost people at sea. Really it's a very sensitive camp, they do great stuff there. Pikba is probably around 70 to 90 but they've got a full-time sort of nurse, they've got a little school. It's a nice place, so it's a nice community. But people don't stay that long there because they are very vulnerable so they will be moved on to either reunification with their family somewhere else or to Athens where they get better medical care. They want to push people stay here. No. Stay here to do what? To do what? There is no job in Greece. There is nothing in Greece. Greece. GDP, 2017. Look where Greece is. There is no life in this country. Everybody is just doing well after the uh, economic crisis. Spain, look. Italy, France, Germany. Everybody is doing well. This is Greece. All the Greeks are leaving this country. There is no life here. I didn't seek refuge to pay and suffer. And I think it is useful to link it to also the, the economic situation in Greece. You know, the economic situation in Greece, because let's not forget that, you know, prior to the so-called refugee crisis, Merkel was being massively criticised uh, because of what was happening in the uh, EU and because of the, the troika and the squeeze on Greece and the imposition of austerity against the wishes of the Greek people. And then kind of shortly afterwards, Angela Merkel is in line for kind of the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> so because of her kind of nobility in dealing with this with this refugee crisis. So I mean, but I think we have to situate also the poverty of Greece. Like, you know, it's really difficult for Greek people now. Like really, they're, as you know, they're really struggling, really struggling. Life is really hard. And, you know, I think there's a lot of... Uh, there's a lot of people, I would say, on the borders of Europe who their lives are really difficult and yet they're still helping the stranger. You know, they're still responding as much as they can in a, in a generous and hospitable way. Uh, you know, Scala people, there's 
in in the small village down there's i think it's 187 residents something like that permanent residents and they've been amazing and it's not because they suddenly really really want refugees it's just the fact that it was happening something had to be done and even if you were angry or upset that it was happening you couldn't walk past a child in need and do nothing and maybe because they're closer to what was going on because and it's a fishing village so the fishermen were, were rescuing people constantly and have in the past the fishermen here have always been amazing <sighs> Molivos. i don't know i really don't know anymore we've tried everything from the beginning to try and work with the people I understand people don't want refugees. Nobody wanted this to happen. But everything we did was greeted with no. Every suggestion we gave them was greeted with we don't want refugees. So they refused from the beginning to address the situation at all. In amongst all the screaming of drown them at sea, shoot them on the beaches, uh, they basically concluded that they do not want refugees. They, they seem to be under the impression that if they dealt with it, it would encourage more to come. And, you know, from that we've had death threats, we've had our tyres cut on our car. Um, we can't really go in the town. If we go to the bank, someone has to stay with the car to stop it getting damaged. We get called up saying, I'm coming to kill you. I've had threats against my daughter. Um, yeah, it's, it's been special. And they really think that we caused the problem because we were nice to these people, we brought them. Um, that we're smugglers, that we've made a fortune. So we, we did it for the money and we did it for the publicity because we're always on the TV, so we must love the publicity. Um, they blame us for the lack of tourism. So we destroyed tourism. And yet, because our volunteers were in fact tourists, to begin with they were then intimidated and threatened by the people of the town so they won't come back it's, the thing is that that's what gets publicized for the island and it shouldn't be because this island has been incredible i can't imagine a group of people reacting any better than the people of lesvos have done the mayor of of lesvos actually takes the whole refugee thing quite seriously he's named the island the island of solidarity it's become quite a good marketing thing but okay it's in the interest of the refugees and it as it should be the people here have done amazingly in Mitilini, the way they've taken care of the refugees the way they've put up with the disruption over the last sort of two three years they've been incredible you know so he he's marketing if you like the situation as the island of solidarity the mayor of um Chios is a right wing a lot of the attacks the fascist attacks on the refugees are actually you see the police with the attacks so all the police do nothing when people are attacked so they have a whole heap of different issues here okay we have local hostility from one town but we still have a massive amount of support and and grassroots groups on the island. Chios is a challenge. On March, on March 18th, to mark one year of the EU Turkey statement, there was a large, a really large protest in Mytilene where about 2,000 people came. And afterwards, the shop owners of Mytilene um, made a complaint to the police um, saying that the police shouldn't have allowed this peaceful protest to walk down the main market street of Mytilene that it disrupted their businesses when the protests probably blocked the street for 15 minutes maximum. And this is kind of the hostility that they've received when they've tried to organize and tried to organize um, and defend their rights here. Refugees are regularly turned away from restaurants, are regularly turned away from shops. So if the complaint is that they don't have customers, why are they refusing service to people who are willing to spend their money there? I mean, I have gone to real estate in agents in Mytilene to ask for information about apartments to rent, and I've been told, well, if it's for Syrians or blacks, then no. I've, been, I've tried to look for office space. Um, to, I was just looking around at different options for office space, and I've been told the same. Well, if it's going to be used for refugees, then it's not for rent. And this is just some, these are things that I've seen, um, but if you talk to any refugee, they know which 
places they'll be welcome and which places they won't. And there's a lot of places where they don't feel welcome, either because they're told to leave or because they're made to feel unwelcome. Most of the violence that we've seen here against, um, against refugees has actually been from the police. Um, so we've seen many, many instances of people who've been unlawfully arrested and unlawfully beaten by, by the police. Um, one individual even had a taser used against him when he was outside the police station on the ground, um, not resisting at all. Um, so these types of events are really frequent here and I think, I think it's because there's a culture of impunity and there's no real accountability for police violence. Um, and this is a population, I mean, police violence isn't something that started with refugees arriving in, in Lesbos. I think police violence is a worldwide problem and now it's that refugees are a vulnerable population who maybe it's assumed don't have the resources to defend themselves or to, um, to be able to hold the police to account. I think this tension and divide between refugees and the local community is also created by how refugees are, are housed on the island is that they're kept in camps outside of city centers. They're, it, it seems like it's the government intention not only in Lesbos, not only in Greece, but to kind of keep refugees out of sight and not allow them to integrate or to move on with their lives here in Europe. I was in Iraq since um, uh, 2005 until mid 2014 in northern Iraq, Kurdistan region. I was uh, graduated from a civil engineering university. I was working in an international company. I studied in uh, Erbil, you know, Saladin University. Because why I left Iran? Because I was involved in the political issues. And I already knew some people from Kurdish party who were in Iraq. And they told me Iraq is good. Iraq is becoming to be the next Dubai in the Middle East. So that's why I picked Iraq. I had problem at that time. I had problem with the government. I was fleeing persecutions. Kurdish problems, for instance, PKK, they are active on all the borders, okay? So you're gonna speak with these people, they speak about their minds, you're gonna speak about your minds. So you got involved in Kurdish uh, issues and you're gonna face problems in Iran. If you speak about Kurdish rights, if you speak about, if you even speak Kurdish, publish uh, materials in Kurdish, they're gonna come after you. I am in distress condition all the time, all the days. Especially, especially since my deportation from Sweden. You know, this is, this is not good. After getting these documents, I went to Sweden and Sweden sent me back to Greece. At the time when Dublin was postponed for Greece. At the time when all the borders were open. Actually, one thing that constantly takes me by surprise is how many mistakes are made by authorities. We do tend to assume somehow that state officials know what they're doing and that if they do something then that must be legally correct even if not morally correct. But actually quite often it isn't. People who are, you know, people who are highly vulnerable, who don't have access to legal advice, can find themselves really at the mercy of bureaucrats and officials. And actually these people, these street level officials have a tremendous amount of power. 
a tremendous amount of power over the lives of other people. Sometimes people try and use that for good. They feel sorry for someone, they try and bend the rules or they kind of view them more sympathetically, but I'm afraid more often than not it's, dare I say it, infused with racism, um, xenophobia and people who are very vulnerable find their rights really abused and they don't even know that the official is acting illegally. They, they won't let you in, you need to call them. They even won't let me in. I'm a refugee. This is a refugee organization. I can't pass the door. This is how it is. This lady is working with them. If they give me the paper immediately, I won't come here ever. If the UNSCR office was somewhere else, I was going to that place, not coming here, having arguments with these fascists. I'm peaceful, you see me here. I am no, I am no danger to anybody. I'm not damaging anything. I'm sitting here to get this paper and get the hell out of this country, all of the end of the story. But everybody is hitting me. Why? They are hitting the wrong person. You see, this guy says, if you sit here, I call the police. If you take pictures here, I call the police. And police come in 10 minutes. Take me to the police station, keep me there for hours and hours. But they are not going after the people who are doing the illegal businesses, you know, the smugglers. They, this, their mindset is wrong. You know, they see refugees as uh, no real human beings with civil and human rights. They don't care for our life, they, our future, our destiny, our daily suffering here. They care for nothing. They extract money from everybody, from everywhere, organizations, government, charity, to help in the name of refugees, to help refugees. Where is the help? They have options. UNHCR has options. I have no options. They must give me the referral letter which is needed uh, for my resettlement according to the Canadian Embassy or US Embassy or if this, this office claims they cannot give me this letter for whatever reason they must direct me to another UNHCR office inside or outside of Europe which does resettlement this is closed or, or they must help they must help organize arrange a meeting arrange a meeting between delegates of Canadian government or US government to come here and negotiate the safe passes for with me. I spoke with the government, with the US, Canadian Embassy many times, Canadian Embassy in Italy, Canadian High Commission in UK, uh, look, uh, Canadian Prime Minister, the Ministry of Citizenship and Immigration, Minister of Citizenship and Immigration. I wrote to everybody, but there is, uh, so far there is no reply. I have no life. There is no way forward, no way backward. It's like a swamp. I'm drowning day by day. And I need help. Because whenever I wrote to the Canadian Embassy or US Embassy, they just send me back to UNHCR. Well, um, all I want to add is uh, I'm kindly appealing to the world, world community, and especially in my case to the Canadian government to help me out. Help me. I need a legal way to get the hell out of this country. I need protection. This is what I have right now is not protection. I was misled by UNHCR. I was uh, betrayed by UNHCR. I was played by Europe's inhumane and immoral asylum system. Don't play refugees. Give refugees safe and legal ways of entry. This is not good. That's all. And please check out my Twitter account and my YouTube. Thank you. Yes, thank you too.